Okay, welcome to the laboratory. We're going to go over our empirical formula lab today. We're going to find the empirical formula of magnesium oxide. So to do that, I want to go through the instructions real quick with you um, as a pre-lab. We're going to do one of the pre-lab questions actually together. Of course, you'll be on your own to do the other. You need to have that wrapped up before you come to class uh, on the lab day. So I'm not sure how well this is going to show up here at the classroom, but we're going to give it a shot. It says in your lab... In a compound, the atoms of different elements are present in small whole number ratios. Uh, the simplest or empirical formula expresses that ratio. Empirical formulas are determined by establishing the mass of each element present in a sample of a compound. From those masses, the number of moles of each element can be determined. The mole ratio is also the atom ratio, um, and that ratio provides the subscripts for what we call the empirical formula. Um, in this experiment, we will determine the mass of each element in a compound by performing a chemical reaction. The reaction we perform is called a synthesis reaction. We will be synthesizing the compound magnesium oxide from its elements, of course, magnesium and oxygen. The magnesium will be provided in the form of a nice piece of magnesium ribbon, and the oxygen, of course, will come from the air. By weighing the magnesium before the reaction and then weighing the product after the reaction, that means after it's combined with oxygen, we can then determine the mass of the magnesium and oxygen in the final compound. These masses can be converted to moles, and the mole ratio of magnesium to oxygen can then be determined. This is the basis of the empirical formula. Let me help you through example one. This will be very similar to the calculation and the problem you'll be doing in this lab. It says a 0.87 gram sample of silver reacts completely with sulfur to form 1.00 grams of silver sulfide. From this information, we should be able to find the empirical formula for silver sulfide. Now, the empirical formula will include silver atoms and sulfur, and we want to find that x to y ratio. So that has to be a mole ratio. We have grams of silver and grams of silver sulfide formed. So I'm going to take my grams of silver, 0.87 grams of silver, and I will find out how many grams of sulfur reacted. Let's think about this for a minute. If I started with 0.87 grams of just silver and ended up with 1.00 grams of silver sulfide, don't you agree that the difference between the two, 0.13, is the mass of sulfur that was uh, used in the experiment? Yeah, that sounds right. So we need to find the mole ratio to find x and y. That's the objective here. So we're going to go from grams to moles of silver. And we always put one by mole. And the grams we get from the periodic table. And for silver kiddos, that is 107.87. And that will give us moles of silver in my compound. Okay, we'll do the same with sulfur. We're going to go from, this is, I'm running out of room here, I should have left myself more space, grams to moles of sulfur. One mole of sulfur is 32.07 grams. Once again, we get that number from the periodic table, and this will give us moles of sulfur that were consumed in that reaction. Let's pull out our calculators here, and we'll plug and chug a little bit. Uh, 0.87 divided by 107.87 shows that uh, I uh, use 0 0.00807. Looks like we're only allowed two sig figs, so we're going to call that 0 0.0081 moles of silver um, in this compound. Let's do the same with sulfur, 0.13. So 0.13 divided by 32.07. Uh, let's see what that gives us. 0 0.0041. Once again, we're only allowed uh, two sig figs, so 0 0.0041 moles of sulfur were used. Uh, in forming this compound. Now we need to find the lowest whole number ratio. So to do that, we divide by the lowest number of moles. So of course we're going to divide both of these by 0 0.0041. Of course that equals 1. 
and that is pretty doggone close to 2. So that means my empirical formula would be 2 moles of silver for every 1 mole of sulfur. So I would write that as AG subscript 2 and S. I don't need to put the number 1 after sulfur to show that there's 1 mole. Okay? Now it's your job to take care of pre-lab question number 2, which is awfully similar. Okay? And then you'll be doing the same type of calculation for this experiment. All right? All right, well, let's get to the experiment now. So you will see we have a, uh, a crucible and a cover for this experiment. So this is called the crucible. Um, and, of course, this is the cover that goes with that. Be careful with the crucible and cover. They're made out of porcelain, and that, of course, is very delicate, and they break easily. In fact, just during the normal process of heating and cooling um, several times, um, the, uh, the porcelain crucible oftentimes, crack, oftentimes will crack. Um, but try not to drop them. Um, they're expensive. They're about uh, $20 a piece. So um, I do expect some breakage, but, but try to be careful. All right. So we're going to take our um, crucible and our cover, and we're going to go ahead and put them on our balance. And I'll do that right now. And we'll take the mass of that. So the mass of our crucible and cover empty is 34 point three zero grams. So on our data table we have a category or a, a spot for the mass of the dry crucible and lid which we have as thirty four point three zero grams. Now we're going to go ahead and put some magnesium in there. And we'll go ahead and we'll coil our magnesium and this is pretty easily done. And then we'll add that to our crucible and then we'll get the mass of our crucible cover plus our lid okay so let's move this up you can see me do this for what it's worth boom and boom so let's see what we end up there with 34.47 grams so we'll record that on our data table now of course the difference between the two is the mass of the magnesium um, before the reaction occurred. Now, before we can find the mass of the crucible lid and product, we have to perform the experiment. We have to react the magnesium with the oxygen. So what we're going to do is we're going to place this with the lid off on our clay triangle. So you'll see we'll take our lid off, place the crucible on our clay triangle, and well, then go ahead and light this. I'll try to take the camera off in just a second so you guys can uh, see what it looks like from the top. So you guys will wear your safety glasses. Make sure you put those on. We'll light our Bunsen burner. We talked about how to do that in the previous lab. Probably want to do it off to the side. Okay. And the best uh, height would be, I'm going to lower this just a little bit and make sure you do this while it's cool, not hot. Um, the height of your flame should be so the tip of that inner blue cone is at the base of what you're heating. So that is actually just perfect there. If you take a look, the tip of the inner blue flame, let's see, I'll use these as my pointer, the tip of the inner blue flame is at the base of my crucible. And we'll allow that to heat. And let's see if I can manipulate my camera without causing too much of a problem. We'll look down on what we're doing. And you can see the magnesium in there as it's heating. And before long, that magnesium will react um, with the air around it. But we have to get it nice and hot first. And when it reacts, it begins to glow. And when it begins to glow, we'll go ahead and put the cover on. Um, in case any of the product wants to escape, we want to keep it inside that crucible. So we'll go ahead and we'll let that heat for a bit. Sometimes it's interesting how this works. Sometimes the reaction will be over in, oh boy, just a minute or two of heating. And other times it takes uh, several minutes for the magnesium to get hot enough for, uh, for it to react. And I'm not quite certain as to why uh, some groups it takes longer than others. So you'll notice my crucible is getting nice and red hot on the bottom. And that's just fine. Don't worry about that. They're made to withstand high temperatures. And we'll take a view from the top again. Hook down here. And you see that's nice and red hot inside there. That's making that magnesium nice and hot, and we'll get that to react with the air in the room here. 
hopefully before long. <laughs> Sorry for all the jostling, it's just the best way I can think of for us to be able to do this. Oh, there we go, so we have a nice reaction. You can see that the magnesium is burning in the air. We're going to put the lid on. You should do that as soon as you see that happening in the lab. So we'll do that quickly. Just put the lid right over top. We'll leave it open just a little crack to let some air get in there. And we'll let that heat for about a minute or so just to make sure all the magnesium has reacted. Just to make sure all the magnesium is reacted and there's enough air in there, after about a minute, we'll use our crucible tongs and we'll take the lid off just to let some more air in there. And let's take a look and see what we have. You can see it's whoops, still reacting a bit. We'll allow that to continue. It's not very exciting to watch, I'm sorry. Uh, at least from this perspective, it's not. Okay, we'll tilt the cover and we'll heat for an additional couple of minutes. So it's still reacting quite vigorously in there. We'll let some more heat in there. Leave that cover open just a crack. We'll allow it to heat for another minute or so. In the interest of time, um, let me go through what we'll be doing here in just a moment. After this is heated, what we will do is we'll allow it to cool for about three minutes. Uh, we'll grind the contents in the crucible into small particles with the stirring rod I'll provide for you. We'll rinse the particles off the stirring rod with a small amount of distilled water and we'll replace the cover and allow it to heat. Now what this is going to do is allow the water to react with any of the nitrides that may have formed with the magnesium. We only want oxygen forming with the magnesium. So, we'll go ahead and shut the heat off now. Actually, I'll let go for just a second. And we'll shut that off. We can remove the lid at this time. Once again, please use your crucible tongs. This is very, very hot at this time. You will burn yourself quite badly if you're not careful. Let's take a look and see what we have down there. Okay, you can see the bottom of the crucible is still glowing red. We're going to go ahead and crush this up with a stirring rod here. We have mostly magnesium oxide there. And what I want to do is I want to rinse the tip of my stirring rod off with just a couple drops of distilled water here. Sorry for once again the vibrations. So I'll do that. And two more drops. Okay. So now I want to heat that again to drive away that water. So I'll pull our Bunsen burner aside and we'll relight it. And we will heat. Okay, just as we were doing earlier. And that process will take another two or three minutes to drive off all that water uh, that we've just added. And along with driving off the water, we're going to drive away uh, the, nit the nitrogen in the form of ammonia as it reacts with water. Okay. Now when that's over, the remaining compound should be pure magnesium oxide. And what we'll do after that is we'll allow it to cool, and uh, we will find the mass of the crucible lid in our product finally. We can do that after the reaction's over and it's cooled. We'll never weigh anything hot. If you weigh it hot, you're not going to get a very accurate measurement, and it's also could be damaging to the balance that we use. And then we'll perform some calculations, and those will be very similar to the ones that you did in your pre-lab, okay? And then at the very end, we'll find the empirical formula of 
our magnesium oxygen compound. Okay. All right, I think that gives you a pretty good idea as to what you're going to be doing in the lab. Hopefully you'll come prepared. Um, and uh, you'll have watched this and you'll be ready to go uh, by the next class period. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you in class. Bye-bye.